All right. Take your Bibles and open them to Matthew chapter 20. 20th chapter of Matthew tonight. The title of my message is Laborers in the Vineyard. So we're going to talk about laborers working for a landowner in his vineyard. But the focus is going to be about people getting saved and uh, becoming eternal residents in the kingdom of God. So would you look, beginning with verse 1 of this 20th chapter. For the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is a householder or a landowner, which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. May God bless us as we study this word together here this evening now. Let me tell you that vineyards in Bible times were very important. They were very important culturally and economically. For in vineyards they would grow grapes and would uh, sometimes uh, dry them out into raisins and they would make wine. Sometimes water would be added to the wine to make it more of a drink that could be, uh, that one could drink. Uh, they also would uh, make vinegar. And so grapevines or vineyards were very important. In fact, that being said, let me tell you that there is no other plant in the Bible, in all of the Bible, no other plant that is mentioned more in God's scriptures than a vineyard. And uh, so there, it's very often mentioned. We find here Jesus is giving a story. He's telling a story that's only recorded in Matthew. It's not in the other synoptic gospels of Mark and Luke. And of course, it's not in John either. But anyway, it's only recorded here in this book, Matthew. And he tells this story uh, to show us that in, uh, in reality, when it comes to uh, our salvation, we could say God's not fair. Well, what do I mean by that? Hang with me. Uh, look at it. The, the workers in the vineyard, the, the, uh, the landowner. And boy, you're already thinking, Pastor Randy has said something that he shouldn't have said God's not fair. No, God is a very fair God. Don't misread me. Don't misread me. Just hang with me. Um, Because some things in life don't make sense to us. And and at the end of this message, you'll see what I'm talking about. But it says the kingdom of heaven. And what is the kingdom of heaven? The kingdom of heaven is the spiritual realm from where God rules. And that is uh, the kingdom of heaven has already come. We are all members of the kingdom of heaven. If we have genuinely and truthfully received Christ as our Savior, then we are in the kingdom of heaven. And right now in the kingdom of heaven, we are here on this earth, in this life. And we're only passing through, for this world is not our home. There is a home on the other side with God, where we are all uh, residents of, where we will live one day forevermore. And so we're, that's in the kingdom of heaven. That's in the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is the spiritual realm of where God lives. And God is in heaven. God is also on this earth and is by way of his Holy Spirit and dwelling in you and I. We are in him. He is in us. We are all in the spiritual realm, the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus says he's going to tell a story to get his disciples to think about something. He, he says, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is a householder. Now that word householder could be used for landowner in this sense, but a householder is someone who's kind of a leader of his home, someone who's kind of over uh, servants that would work for him. Same thing with a landowner. All right, so a landowner which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. Back in those days, they had what is called a marketplace where you would have young men or men of any age, really, for that matter. But these men would go to the marketplace looking for work. 
and landowners who needed to employ people to do the work in their fields would go very early, very early in the morning and try to find workers and say, I've got some work that needs to be done. Who is interested? And these men would come saying, I need some work. I've got a wife and children at home. I've got to provide for them. I need some employment. And so the landowner would hire as many workers as he felt he needed to do that job. And that would take place every day. The workday would begin at 6 o'clock in the morning. The workday in those days would end at 6 o'clock p.m. That's 12 hours. And so at the end of the day, the foreman uh, who worked for the landowner, who was over all these workers, would pay them their wages. So we see then in the context of this verse, the landowner or the homeowner is going to hire some employees to work for him. And uh, when he had, had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, I, I'm not going to take any job for a penny a day. No, 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 that, but, but put this in perspective. In reality, a penny a day, that was different back then. See, when we think of a penny, we're thinking of one cent, and we're thinking of a little copper coin with Abraham Lincoln on it. Back then, another word for penny was denarius, and the, it was a big silver coin, and that uh, denarius was one day's wage. It would equal up to a day's wage. And so the agreement is that the landowner goes out and he finds so many workers, however many, he says, I got some work in my vineyard. I need you to come and help me and get this work done. We got to make some, we got we to pick the grapes and we got to make some uh, wine and vinegar and, 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 and all this. And we need some people to come and press these grapes and pick them and do all these things that you do in a vineyard. So I, I need you to come and help me. And the agreement is, if you work for me in this work day from 6 a.m. and 6 p.m., I will give you a denarius, a day's wage. Fair, right? That sounds fair. I mean, on any job, you go to work and you work on a whole day and the, a whole shift, then uh, to be paid a whole day's work sounds fair, sounds reasonable. And that was the agreement here. Now, remember that these men agreed to this. We then go on and it says he went out about the third hour. After, while these, those men were working from 6 a.m. until 9 a.m., those men were working hard probably very hot, very tired already, working in the vineyard. Then at 9 o'clock in the morning, this same landowner goes back to the marketplace looking for more men to do work for him. So it says he went out, verse 3, about the third hour, that's 9 o'clock, and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. Now we can say that's just like life today. There's so many people that could work and won't work and just stand around and do nothing and then wait on and hope that the government will provide for them and this and that, and they just don't want to work. That's not the situation here. These were men in the marketplace who wanted to work, and no one had hired them as of yet. They're desiring to work. No one has hired them as of yet. They're waiting and hoping someone would come. And so he comes and he finds some more men. Um, men, you know, we got, we got to get this work done today. And uh, I've got men already out there working. Been out there since 6 in the morning. And uh, I need some more help. We got to get this done. I need some more help. And he employs some more men. How many? Don't know. He just employed some others. Now, naturally, we would think that the most reasonable and fair thing would be for them to punch a clock or something and say, all right, they're not working from 6 until 6. They're working from 9 until 6. So the fair thing is for them to be paid a wage from 9 until 6 and whatever, you know, that would come to when you average it out. Sounds reasonable. Sounds fair, right? That's the way we, we work today. That's the way we think. Let's go on here. It says in verse 4, he said to them, go ask, he said, go you in, into the vineyard. Go you also. He employed them. He hired them. Whatever is right, I will give you. He didn't say, I'll give you a denarius. Notice that. He just said, whatever is right, 
I will give you. They went their way. And again he went out about the sixth hour. Now if you count the hours from 6 a.m., by the time you get the sixth hour, that's 12 o'clock noon. While that early bunch came in at six or have been out there working since then, they're probably ready for a lunch break. Those came in at nine. They're starting to get a little bit tired. They've been working three hours. He hires some others at 12 o'clock noon. And then he said, and then he did likewise. It says at the ninth hour. Now that's three o'clock p.m. Remember, the cutoff time is six. So those he hired at three o'clock only have three hours to work. Now, naturally, we would, again, think that the most reasonable and fair thing would be for him to pay his workers accordingly by the number of hours they work. Pay them by the hour. That makes sense. All right, those who started at 12 noon, they're going to be paid from 12 noon until 6. So that'll be half of what those who started at 6 will make, right? And then those who started at 3, they're only going to work a quarter of the day, only three hours. So... They shouldn't get much at all. But get this, watch. It says that he went on out at the 11th hour. And the 11th hour is 4 o'clock. And those men only had one hour to work. They were in the marketplace looking for work, hoping for a job. He hires them, says, go out into the vineyard and help the other guys that are out there working at the 11th hour. And he found them standing idle and hired them. He said, why are you standing here idle? It's not what we think. Again, it's not that they're lazy. They just had not been hired yet. And so verse 7, they say unto him, because no man hath hired us. He said to them, go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that you will receive. In other words, and we could read that and say that he's just pretty much saying, you got one hour to work, and I'll give you a fair wage for that one hour. And that's what it looks like, right? They say, uh, in verse 7, because no man hath hired us. Okay, verse 8. So when even was come, even, that's 6 o'clock. It's time, all right, time, the clock is ticking. It's time now to end the work day, 6 o'clock p.m. It's payday, pay time. It's time for the foreman of the landowner to dish out the coins and give them to the workers. All right, look with me. When even was come, verse 8, at this 12th hour, he, the vineyard, the lord of the vineyard, that is the landowner, called the steward, that is the foreman of the workers, and said, call the laborers, and give them their hire, beginning from last into the first. All right, so he said, uh, those who started at five will pay them first, and then those who were hired at three will pay them next, and those who were hired at 12 noon, then we'll pay them, and those at nine will pay them, and those who started at the beginning of the workday at 6 a.m. will pay them last. Why? We don't really know uh, the reason why, other than for them to see uh, what he's going to do in front of them and how he pays these men it says here in verse 9 when they came they that were hired at the 11th hour that's 5 o'clock p.m. and only worked one hour barely broke a sweat those men who only work one hour they show up to get their pay and it says they received every man a penny a denarius what did I say a denarius is? A full day's wage. Wow. Put this in perspective. Suppose we were looking for work. And somebody, we're in, a, we're in some marketplace, and this boss, this guy says, I'm going to hire a bunch of you to work for me starting at 6 a.m. You're going to work all day long, 12 hours. And in that same situation, the same scenario goes through where by 5 o'clock in the afternoon, some, someone beside you in this room gets hired. Maybe they're sitting in front of you, maybe they're behind you, and they get the same amount of pay as you get for working all day long. Now, think about this. Are we going to say, well, that's nice. We're going to say that ain't fair, right? 
Come on now, let's be honest. That's not fair. I worked all day long out in the field. I've been sweating. I'm, I'm so tired. I can barely walk. And that fellow over there, that woman over here, they only worked one hour, barely broke a sweat, and they get the same amount of pay as I do? Didn't seem logical to them. And it's not logical. Where am I going with this? You will see in just a moment. Hang with me. All right. It says in verse 10 then, when the first came, they supposed that they should receive more. Well, if he gave them a penny all day's wage, then maybe he's changed his mind. And what he promised us when we started at six, maybe he's going to actually double or triple that. Maybe we'll get a whole lot more. But then it says, likewise received every man a penny. Every worker got the same amount. When the first came, they, uh, I mean, verse 11 says, when they had received it, they murmured. They were Baptists. <laughs> Where's that at? No, that's just something I, I said. They murmured against the goodman of the house. I'm just having fun with the Baptists. But anyway, saying, these have wrought but one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden of the heat of the day all day long working out here. All right, now, where am I going with this? Let's go all the way back to verse 1. Let's go through it a second time, but in a different way, in a spiritual application. For the kingdom of heaven, the spiritual realm of God, where God lives, is like a man... Uh, who is a landowner or householder, which went out early in the morning and hired laborers into his vineyard. In this context, I want us to think of the vineyard as being the spiritual realm of God. The vineyard is the kingdom of God. It is God's home. It is being saved. And I want you to think of God as being the landowner. God created this world that we are in. And he has come to call people to salvation. Okay? He called people to salvation. Now, we find here it says that there were some who had agreed to start work at the beginning of the workday at 6 a.m. Now, that thought being in mind, let me tell you that I know as I look out, we all receive Christ at different ages. I received Christ as my Lord and Savior when I was 10 years old. I was baptized when I, uh, right before my 11th birthday. Some uh, get saved earlier than that these days. But that was a very young age. I was 10, and I knew it in my heart that I had received Christ. So I have been a Christian since then. I have lived the life as best I could. And now I'm at the age of 59. And uh, so I've been a Christian for a while, and I've gone through the heat of the day. I've gone through the life, as many of you have. Many of you have done the same thing. Now, when I surrendered into the ministry, and I was ordained into the ministry, I was 24 years old. At that time, I saw people getting saved around that age, and and that was good. You know, they're still young. They're in the prime of their life. And then when I came here to this church, I was 39 years old. That's still kind of, I would consider, in the prime of one's life. And, and people were getting saved at that age. And, and then from then to now, that's about 20 years. They hadn't been a Christian perhaps as long as I have. And I've been around and gone through life, as many of you have gone around and been through life. And, and then now I'm at the age of 59, and so... Uh, and that would be like about the six o'clock hour of life. And, and there are people at that age that get saved and praise the Lord for that. And then the 11th hour, that's right before we all leave to go. And that could be a, a bad ridden confession. That could be like the thief on the cross, someone who gets saved at the very last hour. And then we could look at it and say, all right, for a person who gets saved at the age of 10, a person who gets saved at the age of 23, a person who gets saved at the age of 39 or 59, or 
right before they breathe their last breath, the kingdom of God is going to be equally given to them, and we all receive the same eternal life in heaven given to us from God by way of his grace and mercy. Now, that being said, hold on, look. We could look at it and say, but it's not fair. It's not fair. I, I got saved 55 years ago, 62 years ago, 48 years ago, whatever, it doesn't matter. I got saved a long time ago, and I've, had, I've been in church all those years. I've been giving when the offering plate's been passed around. I've been singing the hymns. I've been worshiping. I've been in church. Where have they been for the last 50 years? And then all of a sudden they get saved, and they're going to the same place I am. It's not fair. You see the point of the story here? You see it? Sometimes we say God's not fair and that God's not right to do this. Well, Jesus was just proving a point here to show that it's not when we get saved, it's that we do get saved. And, but it's not something to play around with either. It's not something to mess around with because we're not promised the next hour, the next moment, or the next second. So we need to make sure before it could be everlastingly too late. Uh, let's go back, and I'm not sure where I left off at. Verse 13, maybe. Um, he answered one of them and said, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Didst not thou agree with me for a penny? We agreed to, when we invited Jesus into our heart, we agreed to salvation. Romans 3.23 says, All of sin that comes short of the glory of God. Romans 6, 23 says, the wages or the penalty of sin is death. It's eternal separation from God. And Romans 5, 8 says, but God commendeth his love toward us and the while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 10, 13 says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So that's what he promised us. That's what we agreed to. That's what we received. Salvation by his grace and his mercy. Take thine that is, he said in verse 14, and go thy way. I will give unto the last, I will give unto this last, even as unto thee. It is not lawful for me to do what I will, will with mine. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? Is thine evil I, thine eye evil because I am good? He's saying, are you jealous because I'm good? He's just being good. Uh, that's a situation where the landowner might not have been fair. He's just being generous. He's being graceful, uh, gracious, I should say. He's being generous. He's being gracious. He's being, he's being nice by giving equal pay to everyone. And, and, uh, and I can see the point of those who worked all day saying it's not fair. And it would be very easily for us to say it's not fair. That someone who breathes their last breath right before they breathe that last breath and they've been an alcoholic all their life. They've been a drug addict all their life. They've been out of church all their life. They've, they've gambled their money away. They, they just live loosely and worldly and, and immorality and it's not fair that they can get saved. And, and yet I've been a Christian all my life and we're going to the same place. Now, that being said, there are different crowns. I mean, a Christian, someone like Billy Graham, for example, who lived the life that he lived, will have many crowns from God. And then someone who did live a rambunctious and terrible, awful life and get saved at the last minute, they're not going to receive as many crowns. But everyone equally receives eternal life from God. That's the point here. Now, the last, he says in verse 16, so the last shall be first and the first last, for many are called, but few are chosen. Many are called, but few are chosen. And by the way, the former part of that last verse was, is a repeat of chapter 19, verse 30. So where we left off last Sunday, chapter 19, verse 30 is where we end off tonight. So the last shall be first and the first last. It's not who we are as a person, we're not to be on a who's who list and say, well, I, I've done this, I've accomplished this, I'm Mr. So-and-so, I'm Mr. You-know-who. And, and um, no, it's, you know, we can be a, the poorest 
most unknown person in the world and still receive the same salvation that a rich, well-known person receives. And, uh, and then I want you to see, many are called, but few are chosen. That just simply means that he's called everyone to receive him to be saved, but not everyone will call on him back. Not everyone chooses him. His choice is that all come to repentance, but not everyone chooses him. And John 1, 11, 12, he came to his own, but his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them give you power to become the sons of God. Matthew 7, 21, there's that verse again. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. You've got to make sure that it's real and genuine in the heart, that we are truly saved. And it doesn't matter if we get saved in the early morning of our life or at midday in our life, around noon, when we're young, say in our 20s or 30s. It doesn't matter if we get saved in the um, late afternoon of our life or the evening of our life when we're getting on up in age or even if it's at the 11th hour, at the last minute. The main thing is we come to know Christ as our Lord and Savior. What's fair, what's not fair? Look, as you, many of you have been following the same thing I've been following, and I've told you I've been following because it's been of interest to me. I like court things and stuff like that. But a man in our state was convicted by the jury uh, of murdering his wife and son. The judge, I watched the judge, as many of you perhaps probably did too on Friday morning, when he told this man, I am sentencing you to two life sentences. And he told him, you will never see the light of day ever again in your natural life. Now, that being said, what if the judge, think about this, with everyone watching in that courtroom, and all of us watching on TV, and it made national attention. It was in South Carolina, down in the low country, but it made national attention all over the whole country. And, and people were watching, the news media and everything. What if that judge, think about this, what if he had said, you're guilty? And as he said, the evidence is overwhelming. But I'm, I'm, going, I'm going to let you go free. I'm not going to put you in prison. I'm going to let you walk out of this courtroom here right now. You can go free. You talk about a, a big upsetting moment to many thousands of people would have been upset if that had happened. And people would have been saying, so unfair, so unfair, so unfair. You know what is unfair? What is unfair is that we were in the court of life, standing before God. And God looks at us and says, Randall Smith and everyone else deserves hell. Because he and everyone else is a sinner. But I'm going to let him go free. Because of the grace and mercy of my son Jesus and his shed blood. I'm going to let him go. I'm going to let them go. They can be free in the, because my son died to set them free. So despite what they have done, they can go. That's what's unfair. What is fair is for us to go to hell forever. That's what's fair. So who are we to question God? If we were God like that song says, we might have done things differently. God is the true one. He's the fair one. We should not ever dare question God. Amen. Amen. That's our lesson for tonight. Thank you for listening. Dear Heavenly Father.